Thank you for joining us on this episode of Legal Angle with Emmanuel the Law Holowale. My guest today is Judge Jessica DeVarger of the Franklin Court, um, Municipal Court. <laughs> you know, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you uh, taking an interest in what we're trying to do here at the Municipal Court. Thank you. Yeah, today we're going to be talking about disrupting the cycle of incarceration. And Judge DeVarga has a program that she has set up that she's pioneering. And she's, you know, the main objective of that program is to disrupt the cycle of incarceration. Yeah, 100 percent. It's one of the one of our main jobs here as judges, I think, um, is to make sure that the people that come in front of us don't come back in front of us again. And I'm really hoping that this program goes a long way in, in enforcing those standards that we set for ourselves. Thank you. What I find interesting is that you got on the bench January of last year, 2020. And I haven't spoken to other judges on the bench. Everyone just keep pointing to you for a kind of leadership when it comes to a program like this. How are you able to accomplish this within a short period of time? Um, I think part of it is I sort of had a plan for myself when I was running for judge. I think in order to undertake a campaign and put your family through all of that and put yourself through all of that and ask your employer to help you through all of that, you know, I really had a clear mindset as far as what I wanted to do when I got on the bench. Um, and it just so happened that because COVID hit in March, um, you know, our, our numbers were very low. We had to shut down for about a month. And even when we came back, um, because our dockets had to be low to maintain social distancing, I had a lot of time to really think about the things that I wanted to do. So time wise was actually, I, I would say COVID kind of helped um, get me started and thinking about all of these things and being able to talk to the people I needed to talk to because we all had a little bit of extra time on our hands to do that. Um, but in the first couple of months that I was on the bench, I realized pretty quickly that we were treating individuals between the ages of 18 and 24, the same way as that we were treating individuals that were in their 30s and 40s, and it wasn't working. Um, and I went to the probation department and just said, we gotta come up with a better idea uh, for, I call them kids, um, <laughs> but you know, they are, they are, they still have the mentality of a juvenile. Um, they may have just come from the juvenile justice system. And so we had to come up with a different way of treating them so that they didn't find themselves in a cycle that was just going to continue to be repeated. Um, so that was a long answer to your question, but the long and short of it is COVID. It, it actually gave me a lot of time to work on the projects that I sort of had in the back of my mind. So it's kind of been a blessing. Hmm. So it was a program inspired by COVID. Uh, inspired by COVID, but um, I had a lot of time to do the research that I needed to do um, in order to actually launch the program. I got to make phone calls to courts in California because no one was running dockets at that time. Judges had a lot of time on their hands to be able to talk to me about their programs. I had a lot of time to be able to call around to the mayor's office and city council and set up meetings because we just weren't in that busy day to day that we normally are. So it just gave everybody an opportunity to kind of think about the things that we wanted to do going forward. Thank you. And before you got on the bench and became a judge last year, you used to work as a criminal defense attorney. What was that like? Um, I loved being a criminal defense attorney. Uh, I did it for about 10 years. I did civil work for five years. I was not happy with my job when I was doing civil work. Some people love it. I was just not one of those people. I really wanted to be in the courtroom. I wanted to be dealing with people. I wanted to be in front of judges. I wanted to be doing hearings and trials. And that's just not the type of thing that you get to do a lot when you're just doing civil cases. Um, so I found Saya and Pyatt. That's the firm that I work for. And it was great because it was sort of a trial by fire type of situation. They just handed me a bunch of files. Um, you know, my boss took me around, introduced me to everybody and said, OK, you know, here, go go do this job. Um, but I loved it. I loved every second of it. I love defending people, working with people. I love being in the courthouse, um, working with the prosecutors. I traveled all over the state, um, lots of different counties. Um, going to smaller counties was always very interesting because it's just completely different than the way we handle things in Franklin County. So I think I was able to see enough of how different courts worked, enough of how different judges worked, 
I handled enough different types of cases to give me a really broad spectrum of background to pull from whenever I decided to run for judge. Yeah. Even while you were doing that, you were nominated and inducted as a super lawyer, you know, by a rising star. What was that like? How did you feel? You know, it's 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 nice to be recognized by your peers because that's a peer endorsement. So it's it's nice that other people kind of recognize when you're working hard. Um, and that's kind of what I always prided myself on was just working hard and doing the best that I could. And um, I was part of the Ohio Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and I helped run one of their biggest uh, CLEs during the year, which was the DUI seminar. And through that, I started teaching CLEs and mentoring young lawyers. And there's really no better feeling than being able to teach somebody else the things that you know um, and, you know, kind of, I think, help the whole entire defense bar uh, get better at their job. Um, and so that was very rewarding as well. Yeah. And you started history as your first degree. So yes. what inspired you to become a lawyer? So this is not one of those really fun stories where it's something I always wanted to do. <laughs> um, I knew that I was either going to have to get my PhD or go to law school. Um, and I did not want to be in school so long as to get my PhD. So I thought, well, I'll go to law school. And in my head, I didn't know that I would ever really utilize my law degree. I thought it would be a degree that would help me get other places. But once I was in law school and started practicing, I realized it really was what I wanted to do. So it was a blessing that I sort of fell into it. But I certainly wasn't one of those people that wanted to be an attorney my whole life. <laughs> so while you were in law school, did you ever see yourself uh, practicing criminal defense law? No, it not it, the farthest thing from my mind. I was interested in environmental law. I took our uh, mediation program. I was interested in mediation. Um, I always thought, you know, I am not the type of person that likes conflict. <laughs> and so <laughs> in the adversarial system. Um, and so I was really kind of focused on those broader spectrum type of legal areas. Um, but turns out criminal defense is exactly where I needed to be. Hmm. So the job you got determined your areas of practice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I tell some of my mentees now, like, don't put yourself in a box, just go to law school and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. Well, and you know as well as I do that what you learn in law school has nothing to do with what you actually do once you graduate from law school. Exactly. So that's great advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, um, there's a cycle of incarceration because you find out that the same people that goes into jail when they come out of prison, they are highly likely to reoffend and get back in prison. Or you find out that people whose parents have been incarcerated, they're also likely to end up in jail. And that's where you come in. I'm sure you've seen a lot of that as a criminal defense attorney and you becoming a judge, you're trying to ensure that that revolving door kind of gets stopped so that you we, we wouldn't have the same people going in, coming out or their kids or grandchildren. So what have you put in place? And that's why you put in place this program called uh, UP, mm -hmm. uh, Mission Potential. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you? I know you told us you started during COVID. How long have you had this program in mind before you eventually put it together? So um, before taking the bench, I was really interested in all of the court specialty docket programs. So talking about recovery court, HART, which is our opiate addiction specialty docket, CATCH, which is our um, human trafficking specialty docket. We have a mental health docket. We have a veterans court docket. Because I knew in my heart after practicing for as long as I had been that when people come through these doors, it's because they've got bigger problems going on. And a lot of time that is addiction. A lot of times it is um, coming from a family that may not be able to give you the support that you need, coming from um, a family where maybe your grandparents raised you, coming from a family where your parents have been incarcerated, and basically not being given the opportunities that other people are being given. And, you know, the best way to try to help people is not by putting them in jail, because the only thing that that's going to do is introduce them to other individuals that are kind of doing the same things. Uh, we're not helping them at all by putting them in jail. What we can do to help them is help their addictions, help them find jobs, um, help them get set up with government assistance so that they don't feel the need to do things like uh, steal from a department store or a grocery store. Um, and especially with these 
young adults, you know, the first thing that came into my mind is after talking with a couple of those individuals who had come to me for probation revocations. So they had missed appointments, they um, had tested positive on a drug screen. They may not have picked up new charges, but they were really faltering on their probation. And, you know, one thing that I kept being told over and over again was they didn't really have a place to stay. You know, they would stay at their aunts, they would stay at their grandma's, they would stay with friends. Um, they didn't have a phone, they didn't have a driver's license. Um, they had lost their driver's license. They owed money to the BMV from something that happened three years ago, and it was preventing them from getting a job. Um, a lot of them had not finished high school and not even had a GED program and didn't really have anyone to support them through that process or explain to them what that process was so that they could go through it. Um, so what I really wanted to do was have a safe space where those individuals could have that support that they need to get those basics that a lot of us take for granted. Um, get your driver's license, help you get transportation, help you figure out whether or not um, you can get on public assistance. And if you can, let's get signed up. Let's get you health insurance. You know, let's do all the things that we all take for granted. And then from there, we build a base. We get a GED. We help you find a job. Do you want to go learn a trade? Do you want to go to community college? Do you want to go to regular college? Um, all of the things that, uh, you know, they didn't really have the support to do, I want to try to put in place for them so that once they finish the program, there's no need for them to ever walk back through my doors because they've got the fundamentals that they need um, to take care of themselves and, you know, make those good decisions going forward. Mm. Thank you. And the program itself takes into consideration the trauma that people have been through before they got entangled in the criminal justice system. Yeah, 100%. So one of the great things um, that I learned from a judge in San Francisco is that the, va the vast majority of individuals, and I knew this, but actually hearing it from someone who'd been working with this age group, um, the vast majority of these individuals have been through trauma. Um, they've, uh, they've had an incarcerated parent. They've had friends or relatives that have died from um, from crime or gun crimes specifically. Um, they've had parents who have gone through addiction. Perhaps they've gone through addiction. And so in order to really have a holistic approach to that individual, we have to help them deal with that trauma and come up with tools and give them a toolkit to deal with those traumas so that they don't um, end up going down the same road because of that. So all of the care that we're going to give is trauma-informed. Um, we're going to provide behavioral health services for individuals. So not not mental health services, but services that are going to help them deal with things as they come, um, give them tools so that they um, have better ways to handle situations that they find themselves in. Does that include like counseling? Mm -hmm. It would include counseling. And it also includes the fact that our probation officer and the caseworker that we're going to have working with them are all trained to do trauma informed and motivational interviewing as well. So not only are we going to help them with counseling, get them into programming that we think might be of assistance to them, like parenting classes, anger management, um, time, how to manage your time, how to manage your finances, you know, all of those things that we sort of learn um, in the general course of our lives getting them into um, classes that help them learn those things and then reinforcing it with our programming as well. Thank you. There are, uh, there are a lot of people who find themselves entangled in the criminal justice system because of their mental health. If you have uh, defendants like that, how do you propose to handle them within the UP program? So um, the UP program, because it is not a specialized docket, will generally not be taking individuals who would qualify for our mental health docket, so for LINK. Um, and the same if, if someone comes to us and we believe that substance abuse is truly the base of the issues that they're having, then they would be referred to our specialty dockets. So the individuals who are going to be coming into UP, they may have um, drug use issues. They may have some um, trauma-based issues. Um, so we will address that. But if they have true mental health issues or concerns, they would probably be a better fit for our mental health docket. Okay. And you also offer supportive family services. What does that entail? Um, so the hope, um, and this is 
obviously all going to um, be sort of a learn as we go type of situation. But I have reached out to some providers um, in our community that are willing to provide family counseling services. So once we get our participant on their feet, kind of get them to a place that we feel they're comfortable and maybe able to have a parent or a relative or a brother or a sister come with them to counseling services, um, that's going to be one thing. Parenting classes, I'm really excited that we're going to be able to um, have parenting classes for the individuals that are in our programming. Um, and I, I also want to make the court open to family participation as well. So we're going to have court once a month where all the participants come in. I hope that families get involved as well, because I think family support, as we both know, is one of the most important things that someone can have. And I want to encourage that with our participants. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I was uh, reading through some of the uh, programs and things that you offer, and I see that uh, you offer dialectical and cognitive therapy. And how is that inculcated into the program itself? How do you propose to carry that out without so, having them go through therapy? So uh, the plan is, is that we are going to have everyone assessed to determine what types of treatment or therapy would be in their best interest, if any. There may be some individuals that don't need that one-on-one -on -one type of therapy. Maybe a group therapy type situation would be better for them. So we'll have them assessed. Um, whatever uh, their assessment determines and their assessments will be given by the providers that we're partnering with. Um, so providers like House of Hope. Um, is one of the big providers that wanted to be a part of the program. So we'll have them do the assessments. So my team is not going to do those type of assessments. We're going to leave that to the professionals. But we do have those professionals. Um, we have their phone numbers. We have direct referrals for them. And they have all agreed to participate in the program. Thank you. Are there reasons where the program only targets individuals between the age of ages of 18 and 25? Yep. So um there have been studies done that show that individuals in this age group, their brain development is not complete by the time that they're 25 years old. Their decision making is not the same decision making as someone who is in their late 20s to early 30s. And especially when you're talking about individuals in this age group who have experienced a lot of childhood trauma. Um, so the goal of this program is to really focus on that age group because we know developmentally that they are not going to respond to the same types of probation that adults are going to respond to because they're really not capable of that at this time. So I really wanted to create a program that they were capable of not only um, handling, but of flourishing in and then learning the types of things that they need to learn so that, you know, they don't end up coming into adult probation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you also uh, try to tackle poverty under the UP program. With so, yeah. So th I think if you talk to anyone, right, in the city of Columbus, if you talk to anyone that's um, working in justice uh, initiatives, working in substance abuse initiatives, mental health initiatives, anything like that, they will tell you that housing is the number one issue um, that is adversely affecting our population. And obviously poverty is, is a, a, a result of, um, or homelessness is a result of, of poverty and not giving people um, you know, the, the types of uplifting things that they need to do to be able to take care of themselves. And so we're really trying to tackle and up um, not only getting these individuals educated with a high school diploma or some type of a two-year degree, but getting them jobs. Um, and we're working with a program called AMP, uh, which is run by the county, um, and they're going to be providing really great services for our individuals that are going to meet them where they are, whether it's a GED, whether it's uh, working with unions, whether it's uh, specific uh, training related to a trade, a two-year school, four-year school. We're going to make sure that our participants get that because with that, um, then we're going to be able to eliminate that sort of poverty issue that keeps arising um, because we're going to get them stable jobs. And with that, we're hoping to also be able to get them stable housing. And I actually just uh, did a site, um, site review yesterday. Alvis is running a new um, program where they're going to be providing us with a couple of rooms so that if we have someone that's in an emergency type situation, we have emergency housing that we're going to be able to provide to them for anywhere from three to six months. Thank you. You mentioned HAMP. Was the AMP is an acronym? 
AMP. It is uh, Achieve More and Prosper. Uh, that's that's uh, what AMP stands for. And again, that's a county run program. And it's not just going to be my participants that can utilize AMP. That is a program that is open to any individual between the age of, I believe it's 16 and 25, that AMP is open to for uh, job training and workforce development. Okay. You also mentioned Travis. What is? Oh, Alvis. Alvis House. Alvis, yes. Yeah, Alvis House Alvis. is a substance abuse uh, slash reentry organization, and they provide. They have outpatient counseling, inpatient counseling. They have halfway houses for individuals coming out of uh, the Ohio Department of Rehab and Corrections. And this is just adding on to the list of things that they've been doing in the community. Okay. And what are the parenting services that this program will be offering? What are the what? The parenting services? Oh, parental services. Um, so financing, we're, we want to work on individuals to make sure that uh, they're able to uh, work with their finances, parenting classes, anger management, um, working with job and family services. If these individuals need anything specific with regard to, let's say that someone doesn't have uh, custody of their children or someone is looking for um, reunification with their children, you know, we're going to try to work with them to make sure that that's not going to be an obstacle to them successfully completing the program and going forward. Thank you. And the op services, you know, you also try to do it within a culturally sensitive or culturally uh, competence, competency. Yeah. So how do you define cultural competency and how do you train people to be culturally aware? Um, so I guess I would define cultural competency as an understanding that the individual that you're dealing with, it may be coming from a different background than you are, and you need to be understanding of where that individual is coming from and meeting them where they are. Um, what we have done is um, the two individuals that I've hired to work with our program, first and foremost, they both have um, a history of working with juveniles in the, in the justice system, which was really important to me, um, not to have someone that's never worked with this age group before. Um, both of them are African-American males because I really wanted there to be um, a connection um, with our participants who, just based on um, the cases that we've reviewed and over the past couple of years, what we've seen, um, I, I believe that the majority of our participants are going to be young African-American males. Um, and I think that, you know, that's probably not a surprise to anyone who works here every day is unfortunately that's the majority of the population of individuals who we see come in. Um, and our caseworker is actually an individual who was incarcerated for quite some time with the Ohio Department of Rehab and Corrections, um, successfully um, re-entered the community, and I think is amazing in the way that he can connect with individuals and really come from a place of, I've been there, you don't want to be there, and mm -hmm. here's the things that you can do to make sure that you don't end up in the same place that I did. Um, so I was really focused on trying to get people that I knew our participants would be able to connect with because that might not be me. Okay. And does the program make accommodations for uh, people within the LGBTQ community? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's actually, and there's a couple of court programs that do as well. We have the CAPIT program, um, which is a program specifically for same-sex couples that have issues with domestic violence or anger management. We're going to be able to utilize CAPIT. We also have our MARCH program um, that has, um, we provide services that specifically related to LGBTQ. So yes, we are, um, you know, going to be able to provide whatever type of assistance that the individuals come into our program might need. Thank you. Yeah, and um, we can't talk about criminal justice without acknowledging the fact that racism, uh, targeted law enforcement, and even targeted prosecution play a role in having mass incarceration of people of color. How does the OP program address this issue? Well, I think it addresses the issue by having an understanding that when people come in front of me, well, first and foremost, um, I don't just assume that they've done what they're charged with. And secondly, that there has that there are viable options other than just putting someone in jail whenever they get in trouble. And, you know, part of the reason that 
um, individuals end up in front of us is because of systemic racism and things that have just sort of become a part of our society. And what I hope to be able to do is to even the playing ground um, by, you know, providing the types of support and services necessary so that um, when the people leave the program, they don't feel a need to ever come back where they are because they've, they've got the things that they need to move forward. Thank you. And your court only handle misdemeanor cases? Yes, we only handle. So the municipal court only handles misdemeanor cases. However, um, uh, Prosecutor Tyak, um, who is the uh, county prosecutor who handles all the felonies, their office has agreed to refer low level felonies to the program, which is great. Um, I think that there's going to be you know, the the opportunity to not have a felony on your record is huge. Having a felony on your record is going to adversely impact you for the rest of your life and everything from driver's licensing, voting, getting a job. I mean, having a felony on your record is sort of the beginning of, of obstacles um, that, are, that are very difficult to take away once you have it. And so I'm excited to have the opportunity to make sure that not only does an individual not have a felony on their record, um, but we can set them up in such a way that that's never going to be something that happens down the line. Thank you. How do how will the individual become aware that this program exists? Is it something that the prosecutor will offer or is it something that the judge will offer during sentencing? Or so, yeah, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry. Um, so I we have been educating the public defender's office, we have been educating the prosecutor's office and the probation department. And so at this point, everyone should be aware that the program exists. Obviously, I think word of mouth is probably gonna be um, the best thing. You, I think you're, you're aware that the Franklin County Municipal Court is much like a large high school um, in that, you know, it's sort of a big game of telephone. So I think once we get some uh, participants into the program and people see what we're doing, um, that that's going to be the best way for people to know about it. But um, yeah, we are, we are in the process right now of educating the prosecutor's office and the public defender's office so that they know when they see someone that fits this category, uh, that they know that the program could be an option for them. Have you, have you started admitting people into the program? Monday. So December 6th is the first day that we are going to start taking referrals. And we have already had at least three cases referred to my probation officer that he's going to be able to immediately start working on uh, on Monday. Okay. And what is procedural fairness? So procedural fairness means um, when someone comes into the program, so the, they'll be made an offer. If they finish the program, then um, their case will either be dismissed or it'll be reduced from a felony to a misdemeanor charge. I'm hoping at the end of the day that the vast majority of cases just get dismissed. So what that means for, for the program is Anything that is heard, right, during the penancy of this individual being in the UP program is not going to be used against them should they fail to complete the program, um, should they decide to withdraw their plea at a later point in time and actually have a trial on the case. Um, so they're also going to be given an opportunity at every step of the way. If they've been accused of having a dirty drug test, if they've been accused of picking up a new charge, if they have been failing to contact their caseworker, at every single point in the process, they're going to have an opportunity to talk to me directly and defend themselves um, if I believe that there's a possibility that they might, might not be able to complete the program. Um, they're also going to have an attorney at every step of the way, too. The public defender's office is going to have a public defender dedicated to this docket. Um, so at no point in time will any individual have to represent themselves. They'll always be given an opportunity to have a public defender represent them during the course of the program. Thank you. Is admission into the program contingent upon the parties uh, ad pleading guilty? Or? So um, it depends on what the offer is from the prosecutor. Um, because we are not regulated by the Supreme Court, we're not a specialty docket, we're a diversion program. So really, the defense attorney and the prosecutor can come up with whatever agreement they deem appropriate under the circumstances. How I would like to see things go, but I am not a prosecutor nor a defense attorney, but what I'm going to encourage um, is that an individual enter a plea and that that plea is held in abeyance so that they don't have the conviction on their record during the pendency of the case. Once they complete the program, the plea is withdrawn, the case is dismissed. 
that's how I hope to see everything go. But again, that's going to be um, on a case by case basis, depending on the prosecutor's offer. Thank you. And this program you know, applies to all the judges on the bench. You know, because they have to buy into this program. I, every, you know. So I have asked for the other judges' support. Um, it is up to each and every individual judge as to whether or not they want to refer a case to the docket. Um, so just like a specialty docket, if someone approaches a judge, they have to sign a form indicating that they approve the referral into the UP program. But I can tell you that in my discussions with the bench and in our judges' meetings, the judges um, unanimously seem to be in support of the program. So I don't foresee it being an issue that a judge would not permit a case to be uh, transferred into the program. So all the judges are on board? Yes, at least at least that's what everyone raised their hand when I asked <laughs> if they would be willing, willing to send some cases my way. So yeah, everyone has been on board. Yeah, prosecutors, the prosecutor's office are they already they've already agreed to be a part of the program, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. And I also believe victims also have to agree that the defendant should be in the program. Yeah. So if it's a situation where there is a victim involved, um, obviously Marcy's law would apply and the prosecutor's office just generally any time that they're going to resolve a case for something other than a guilty plea, they have to ask the victims um, for they have to ask the victim for input. And um, my understanding is that there would have to be permission from the victim that they come into the program. Okay. Yeah. What would happen in a situation where you have a uh a defendant that is a poster child for this program, and then the victim did not, you know, maybe victims or victim oppose uh, admission into the program. So um, my, my hope is that, be, so my probation, I have a probation officer specific to my program. My hope would be that perhaps if that individual did find themselves on probation, that, you know, they would find themselves coming over to my probation officer, and we could still hopefully be able to provide some of those services that we would be able to provide um, in the UP program, but unfortunately not be able to have that uh, case or that charge dismissed and expunged at the end of the day. So, you know, I think starting this program and having the agreement of the probation department means that they're also committed to understanding that there is a difference between individuals in this age range and older individuals. And I think that they will be applying that going forward. Thank you. And who is the up coach? Uh, so the coach is a caseworker. Um, so basically it is an individual who is going to work hand in hand with our participants as they complete each task in their case plan, whether that is driving them to the BMV and sitting with them to get their license, whether that's sitting down with them and helping them budget their finances, helping them with their resume, getting them to their parenting classes, and basically just being peer support and encouragement um, as they go through their case plan uh, to complete the program. Um, it's it's a friend, it's a mentor, it's a support. Um, it's someone who is not employed by the court. Uh, we are contracting with a program called Think Make Live um, for those services. And so I'm hoping that it becomes a confidant that that individual will maintain contact with even after they complete the program. So coaches are not going to be coming from the uh, probation department. That's correct. The, we have a probation officer specific to the program, but the coaches are not, they're not on court staff. Okay. Uh, coach is going to work along with the probation officer assigned to individual cases? Correct. Okay. And our coach is going to be trained and screened? Correct. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so the individual that we've actually hired on as our coach used to work for Impact, um, which is another community organization. Um, but yeah, they're going to go through the same types of trainings that our probation officers will go through. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you know uh, individuals going to get one coach? Yes. Or will a coach be responsible for more than one individual? So a coach will be responsible for more than one individual. But for the first year of the program, we are keeping our numbers between 20 and 30 participants. That way, between the probation officer and the coach, there'll be plenty of time for them to dedicate to each individual participant. I'm hoping that if the program is successful and we can show that the program is successful, that we'll be able to add more caseworkers so that we can add more individuals into the program. 
Okay. Since you have like a cutoff number for the people you want to admit within the first year, you say between 30 and 30, what happens in a situation where the program is full and you have all these eligible um, candidates? Are you going then, to put them on a waiting list? So um, there's a couple different ways I intend to handle that because I hope that that happens. I hope that the program is successful and that enough people want to do the program. Um, so the first thing that I would do is, you know, go back to our community and ask for additional funding to have another caseworker. Um, if we do that, then you know we'll be able to add more participants into the program. Alternatively, like I said, I'm hoping that our probation department will maybe kind of learn from the things that we're doing in the program and just be able to apply some of the same standards um, that we're going to be applying to individuals that come onto their caseloads. Um, but 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 hopefully, you know, the answer is we find more funding, we hire more caseworkers, we admit more individuals into the program. Well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong from what I'm, I'm hearing that the program right now has a terminable funding. So the funding is now renewable. That's correct. Right now we've got, um, so the mayor has provided us $250,000 that pays for a caseworker and a probation officer for about a year. Um, there are a lot of grants um, that we will be able to apply for, but we really needed to get on our feet first uh, before we could start applying for those grants. So I can and I can tell you that there has been an outpouring of support from the community, from our public leaders, from city council, from the mayor's office and from the county commissioners. And so I'm not overly concerned that if the program is, in fact, successful, that we'll be able to maintain funding. Right. And how long is the program supposed to last? Uh, one year. So uh, every individual will be put on probation for two years, but the goal is that they complete the program one year, case is dismissed and expunged. If they don't successfully complete the program, then they just have to finish out that second year of probation. Um, and obviously they find themselves with that conviction on their record. Okay. Thank you. So once the program has been completed, the record is erased as point as if it never happened. Correct. So that's the incentive for people to want to participate in the program. Absolutely, 100%, along with just all the services that we're gonna be able to provide. And hopefully at the end of the day, you know, they're gonna be in a situation where they're on their feet, able to provide for themselves and not find themselves in, in a court, courtroom again. Thank you. Oh, you have our uh, six year old twin boys. I do. Wow. How are you able to do all these things, maintain a family, and still running programs to help people? And uh, I have an amazing husband. <laughs> That's first and foremost. He is incredibly supportive. Um, my colleagues on the bench are incredibly supportive. And this is what I love. This is my passion. And so, you know, no matter how much time it takes, um, I'm going to make sure that I'm doing the things that I promised that I would do when I took the bench. Um, and, you know, I love my family and I'm proud of the things that I've done and I want them to be proud of me. And so it just, it all works. You get up early, you go to bed late, but as long as you love every minute of every day, then it's worth it. Thank you. And what is it like raising twins? Having to do double the work at the same time. <laughs> so it's interesting because we didn't know any different, right? There are only kids. And so everyone says that. And I'm like, well, you just do it, right? Just like with your first child, you know, you, you it's like, oh, I have to keep these humans alive. I just have to do all the things and you, you just do it. Um, and they're a lot of fun. And, you know, they always have that built-in friend, that built-in kind of partner, um, and so it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. And it's very rewarding. That's amazing. And are you the first lawyer in your family? Yes. Probably the first and only because they see all the things that I've had to go through and do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. To, you, wow. You're also an avid runner. Is that the way you take care of your stress? 100% that is the way I take care of my stress. It's also the way that I get to catch up with my friends. <laughs> because, you know, Have you ever run a marathon, a half marathon? Yeah, I've run um, somewhere in the range of 30 half marathons and I've done two, two full marathons and I'm signed up for a full marathon next spring. That's um, incredible. I really like to eat food, you know, and so I feel like if I'm running, then I can eat whatever I want. <laughs> now we see where you get all the energy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
uh, thank you for coming into Legal Angle and for even for setting up Unleashing Potential, you know, in order to disrupt the cycle of incarceration. You know, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time you have taken to set up the program and also for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate your interest in the program. And if anyone has any questions about the program, that's my email address. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my courtroom is 13D is in David at the Municipal Court. Stop in and see me if you have any questions. I'm happy to talk about it. And hopefully in about six months, I can come on again and tell you about all the great things that my participants are doing. <laughs> we would love to have you. And for those of you watching or listening to us on the podcast, Thank you for joining us. Until next time, stay safe. Thank you.